Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar on how to make lighting design work in small venues presented by Jason Hager. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter and they'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar is also being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to, to Jason Hager, the presenter for today's webinar. Jason has been a creative lighting designer since 2011, beginning his career at the Burning Man Festival. Since then, he has worked on countless festivals and several national tours as a lighting designer, director, programmer, and operator. And now I'm gonna pass the mic over to you, Jason. Hey, how's it going, guys? My name is Jason Hager. I am based out of Lake Tahoe, California, and today I'm going to go over how to make lighting design work in small venues. Bear with me, this is the first time I've done a webinar like this. So if I talk a little bit too fast or I you know, don't exactly explain a topic fully, be sure to let me know after the webinar in the chat and I'll try to answer any questions you might have. Um, so start off a little outline of how the presentation is going to go. We're gonna start with a few key points that are kind of uh, uh, key points that, oh yeah, you see, here we go, the public speaking for it. So we're just gonna get right into it. So the first one right here, how to design your rig around small venues. Uh, second point, how to overcome common obstacles in smaller venues. Uh, and then we're gonna kinda get a little bit more in depth about the different types of designs you might do in smaller venues. So designing for one-off shows where you may just be doing one show in a venue you've never been to before, designing for tours where you have to design a rig that's gonna work in every venue you go to on the tour, big or small, uh, then designing for permanent installs where you might have to work with a client a little bit more closely to get exactly the look that they want for their space, uh, and then a little bit of a recap to go over some stuff that we talked about and some things that I might have missed. Okay, so how to design your rig around a small venue. So first off, I would recommend using fixtures that give you the best bang for the buck. When you're in a small venue and you're designing a lighting rig, most of the time you really don't have the biggest budget. Sometimes you do, but most of the time you're gonna find that they wanna get the best bang for the buck out of you know whatever budget they have available. So what I would recommend for this area is, you know. Martin, for example, has the MH series, and they're very good, very budget conscious fixtures that you can get a lot of and put in a space that kind of fills out the room a little bit more so than if you were to go with some Vipers, where you may only be able to get two or four of them for your entire budget. Um, these kind of fixtures definitely have their pluses and their minuses. They're, they tend to be small, so you can fit a little bit more into a smaller space. But their feature set sometimes is lacking, so you might want to supplement that type of rig with fixtures that are a little bit more costly, but provide a better feature set, like overlapping gobos or prisms to make the lights look bigger. Um, some of these pictures I have over here are some gigs I've done in the past, and a good example of that would be the, uh, the blue picture. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here or not, but you know, that was about eight lights on the ground and pointed up at the ceiling or the walls with a cool gobo and overlapping prism pattern, you know, it made the room feel a lot bigger than it was. Um, moving on here to placing your fixtures in a way that provide a larger feel, placing them into a curve or multiple layers. So I'm gonna open up a capture file here. So this is for a tour that I did recently, actually, uh, at the beginning of 2020 before the whole lockdown happened. We actually ended up getting turned around mid-tour, had to come back home, but it is what it is. Um, so this is a rig that was mostly a floor package. Uh, if you're not familiar with floor packages, you know, they are lighting rigs that you can set up mostly, you know, with truss or with Schedule 40 pipe 
that you can place on the ground at a venue and you can hang your fixtures directly on the truss or like in this kind of design, I hang, hung some schedule 40 in between the truss and then hung the fixtures from that. So as you can see, it is a curved design. So, you know, it's wider on the outside than it is in the center. Uh, it makes it so I can use the entirety of a stage that I show up to uh, at a venue rather than, you know, say if I were to just have my B rig, which is here somewhere. My B rig is a little bit flatter, but still curved. Um, another way to help out with that is to add multiple layers to your design. So rather than just having a single piece of Schedule 40 going across with my fixtures, you know, we layer them with the same fixture types on different layers, kind of create a wider look with all of the lights. So, um, the use of pixel mapping fixtures. So any fixture that has multiple instances uh, of pixels, like as you would say in MA, you're able to use either, I mean, depending on the console you're using or media server you're using, you can send content, content out to the fixtures in many different ways. But having more than one light emitting diode on a fixture helps uh, add some stuff to the stage and make your design look a little bit bigger than it may be based on your size constraints that you have. Um, adding a video or laser element if the budget allows. Now, this is definitely something that the budget is going to constrict a lot. Like there's a lot of times where you're not gonna be able to spend a couple thousand extra dollars on a laser package. But as you can see down here in uh, my photo at the bottom with the rainbow lasers, you can, these are, that's just two lasers and it makes the rig look a whole lot bigger for being in a small venue. Um, using existing rigging points or trust to hang your fixtures if available. So if you can hang it, definitely hang it. It's great to put stuff on the floor, but it's not always feasible. Always, it's also not always feasible to be able to hang stuff in a venue. So when you do have the opportunity, I highly recommend doing it. Um, and this rig here, I programmed in my house rig. This is kind of just a generic house rig, just some beams, some washes, some spots. And I just put them hanging on some truss just so I can get it into my programming, into my rig. So I know that if the house rig is there, I'll be able to use some stuff really easily when I get to the show. Um, try to get a CAD drawing or some kind of plans for the room so you can properly pre -base. Most small venues won't have this, but it can't hurt to try. I try to ask every single time. If the venue has some type of plans for the room or even just like a handwritten drawing like it helps a lot to be able to um, figure out what you're going to do ahead of time and there are a lot of small venues where you have to design a rig kind of on the fly so you're going to show up to the venue and you're going to have to put stuff where it fits like there's nothing you can do about it because either you didn't properly advance with the venue beforehand or the information they gave you was wrong you know lots of different things can happen when it comes to that so you kind of have to be prepared and plan ahead for the worst case scenario. But if you can get a drawing, most likely the drawing they give you is going to be accurate. So if you can, definitely try. Um, so let's go back to pixel mapping fixtures for a second. There's many different ways to control pixel mapping fixtures, and it's really important that when you're designing the rig, you're also designing the network. So if you have fixtures that take up 512 DMX channels, like the new Mac or a Pixel, like you're going to have to figure out a way to either run your entire rig on Ethernet or to have a ton of nodes everywhere to be able to distribute that DMX signal to those fixtures. So when it comes to those kind of things, I personally, I always run them in extended mode. Like I absolutely love the look of the pixel mapping stuff, but it's something you definitely have to plan into your design beforehand, especially if there's going to be any guest LDs using the rig because the guest LDs will come in and they don't exactly like a 512 channel fixture and to all of a sudden have to patch 24 universes worth of fixtures just to do your pixel mapping stuff. So 
it definitely goes hand in hand with being prepared ahead of time and making sure that you're using the best types of fixtures and the best modes for your design. On to our next slide here. How to overcome obstacles in smaller venues. So the first thing you have to think about is space. So not only how much space you have for your lights, but how much space you have for the band or for the DJs that are gonna go on the stage as well. So when you are making your, uh, your original design, like your, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. Um, when you're doing your preliminary design, when you're looking at the space and seeing what the height, width, and depth of the stage is and trying to figure out where you're gonna place your lights, Figuring out where the band is gonna go is also a very important thing. In smaller venues, you have small stages. So you may have a, you know, a six by 12 foot space that you have to fit your band and your entire floor package. And the venue doesn't even allow you to fly anything. So you have to figure out a way to put stuff on the stage in a way that the band is still gonna be able to perform. They're not gonna get blinded by the lights flashing in their faces the whole time. And also that the band members physically aren't gonna actually block the lighting from having its effect as well. So that is the first thing you have to think of when you try to design anything for a smaller venue. And with a bigger space, it's you know really not that much of an issue. You have a huge 48 by 48 stage and you have your whole band on there and you can have your floor package and, and it's fine. You don't really have to worry about that. But with smaller venues, uh, for example, this picture down here is a venue in Indianapolis and the two pillars you see here, there were identical pillars on the stage about six feet back, like right by the video wall. And there's also another one that runs along the top ceiling right here. So I had to take my rig that was normally 20 by 12 and I had to turn it into like a six by eight. Um, <clears throat> and that's just kind of something that you have to deal with in smaller venues. And and honestly, like I really like the way that that rig turned out because putting the lights closer together kind of gave me a different effect than I normally would get with them. So there, there are pluses and minuses to the space problem here. Um, and next we move on to power. Do they have enough power? Not the right receptacle or service. So do they have enough is that's kind of like your first um, obstacle that you have to overcome when it comes to power in any venue. And Smaller venues normally don't have three-phase power. Sometimes they do, and it's really awesome, but 90% of the time you're gonna be showing up to a smaller venue and they're gonna have just Edison plugs on, on the stage or maybe like a 50 amp receptacle. Um, so that brings us down to having not having the right service or receptacle. Um, if you have a three-phase distro and you're expecting to go and do every venue and, have, and they're, they're gonna have the cam walks for you to tie in, you're sorely mistaken. <laughs> it would be great if that was the case, but it is not, and you have to design your rig. Oh, the little annotation thingy. Oh, it doesn't let me move it. That's annoying. Okay, I'm just gonna exit out of that. Uh, thanks, Fred. Um, so when it comes to power receptacles, so you need to make sure that you're prepared for every situation. So if you need to take your snakes apart or have extra extension cords to be able to plug into Edison power on the wall, you know, it's something that you may get frustrated about, but it's just something that is gonna happen. So definitely be prepared to plug in to just a regular wall outlet if you need to. Have tons of extra triple taps with you just in case you need to split up some circuits from where they're at already. Um, also, make sure you talk to two people at the venue about the power, because the one guy that is trying to tell you that, oh, all these circuits are separate, you can plug your sound system into this and plug your lights into this, like, there have been so many times where that's just been false, and I've had the sound system or the lighting rig go out because the circuit blew in the middle of the show when, when the band was getting super crazy with it, so, I really recommend talking to multiple people and making sure you confirm where your power is coming from rather than just relying on one person's opinion of what's happening. Um, haze, will they allow it? Can you use too much? Placement of the hazer. And if no haze is allowed, how does that affect your design? So there have been a lot of venues that I've worked in that 
have haze restrictions. So they like haze, but you can't do too much of it because they have a sensitive HVAC system or they have neighbors that have a sensitive HVAC system. Uh, and then, you know, that could be a very bad thing where, you know, you're in the middle of a show and all of a sudden the fire alarm goes off and, you know, it varies depending on different venues what happens then, but it, it's never a fun thing. So when I design my rig, I always think about the fact of if I can use haze or not. So in the advancing process, which we'll go over a little bit later in the presentation, um, I always, you know, ask if haze is okay, ask if there's any restrictions with haze or anything like that. Um, and if haze is not okay, I have to plan my design around that. So using fixtures that have really intricate gobo sets or prisms or fixtures that have an animation wheel. So if you're not familiar with what an animation wheel is, it's just kind of like a little rotating wheel that goes, it's not a gobo, it's not a prism, but it's more so, it gives you kind of like a moving water look out of your light. And you can overlay that with a bunch of different things in the light as well. So you can use your gobo wheel, you can use your prism with an animation wheel as well to give you some really cool wiggly effects. So if you're in a venue that doesn't allow haze, you know, use lights that have that type of feature set, but then also you have to think about the positioning of the lights. Now, where are you going to aim those lights to get the best effects? Are you mostly just lighting up the band or the DJ with them? Or are you trying to do a little bit more of crowd lighting? So when you can't use haze, the crowd lighting actually helps a lot. So it'll kind of make the room pop a little bit more because you don't have all the aerial beam effects. So something that I'm not normally a fan of doing in that type of situation, I would tend to try to throw a couple pieces of trust out in the crowd and, and light the crowd up a little bit. Um, placement of the hazer, if you can use it. Um, I've had a few artists that don't like to see the hazer. So you want to make sure that you, if you only have one, you kind of tuck it off to the side in the center a little bit. Or uh, if you have two, just kind of, one on stage left, stage left and stage right, uh, kind of towards the rear of the stage and keep them so they can be emitting in an even fashion. Um, obstacles on the stage, pillars, beams, and prosceniums and, exi and existing fixture hangs. Um, it's something that a lot of small venues have, pretty much every one of them has something going on. It's very rare that you get to a small venue and it's just a perfect stage with nothing in the way. <laughs> it's, it's an awesome feeling when it is, but it really doesn't happen very often. So make sure that when you're doing your advancing process and talking to all the people at the venue and figuring out what their requirements are versus what your requirements are, make sure you ask them specifically about anything that is obstructing especially if you're doing any type of projection video, like that is like the first thing that you have to ask uh, is if anything, seems, if, that, if anything is obstructing uh, in the dance floor area. Um, I found a lot of times when I get the de height, width and depth information for a stage, they won't include the proscenium in that or they kind of like don't really explain the fact that there's a proscenium there in the info that I get. So I show up and there's all of a sudden, you know, the height, width, and the depth of the stage is what they said it was, but then there's a proscenium blocking everything that's in, in the way there. So definitely taking that into account. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into how to do that for those different, different uh, types of designs in the next couple slides. Um, front of house placement. Will it be in the center and how far from the stage? So it's something that it's more of a personal preference for me. Like I really enjoy being in the middle. I feel like I do a better job if I'm in the center of the room. Um, and there are a couple different ways to overcome this. Uh, one of them would be, of course, setting up your front of house in the center of the room, getting your programming done and focusing done and then moving off to the side. Uh, another one would be using a focus remote so you can have your front of house set up off to the side and then when you need to do your focusing you go into the center with the remote um and then another one could be putting a camera in the center of the room and having a monitor at your front of house off to the side um any one of those works i try to in, in all my advances i state that 
front of house must be in the center. And there are certain times where, of course, the venue can't accommodate that, but I try my best to make sure that I'm in the center every time. I feel like I give a better show if that's the case. Um, so sometimes obstacles actually make the show better. Uh, they introduce something that was not in the original design, such as I was talking about before here by kind of placing the lights closer together. Uh, it made for something that was unexpected, and, uh, and I honestly quite enjoyed that show. Um, another one is this venue here. We weren't able to set up anything, and we just had to bring in a floor package, and I uh, put some lights on the ground that I normally don't, and it looked really awesome, and I was really happy with it. So, you know, sometimes those obstacles that get in the way of these small venues can definitely make the show better. Um, Yeah, let's show you this obstacle. This was a fun one. So this stage was meant to have these awesome wings on it. Uh, and this is the original design that I came up with. Uh, it was for a show in Santa Cruz, California. Um, and it had these wings with some video panels and some battens on it. Uh, but when I got to the venue, I was told that they needed to get an eight by 10 DJ riser by on the side of the stage and it was about a foot too short with having these there so i had to remove them and i ended up putting those lights up in the air and it honestly ended up working out great and, and it wasn't my original design and i would have loved to be able to go with it but you know those are just the kind of things that end up popping up at these smaller venues and there's nothing you can do about it and you just kind of have to roll the punches <sighs> So now we're going to get kind of more into the different types of shows that you're going to be designing for these smaller venues, uh, designing for one-off shows. So I kind of like lay this out in like, I always ask myself a bunch of questions. Like when I get the gig and I, and I have to start to design, like I ask myself all these things and the answers that I get kind of determine what kind of rig that I'm able to design for it. So first off, can you fly stuff? So a lot of these smaller venues are not gonna have rigging points for you to fly stuff. Even if they do have rigging points, there's already gonna be existing fixtures on it. They don't want you to take them down and, and put your own stuff up. So for one-off shows, it actually, you have a little bit more leeway with that because you have a little bit uh, different of a relationship than with a touring show. Um, so there are some venues where they'll let you strike their rig and put yours up for the day. Um, doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's cool, and definitely plan your design around that if it's able to happen. Because when you can fly stuff, you can make the stage look way bigger, especially in a venue that has a pretty small stage but may have high ceilings or something of the sort. Um, the power of the floor package. Now, once again, the floor package is anything light-wise, video-wise that you put on the ground that you can either support with trusts, you can just put onto cases, um, but it enables you to bring in a lighting rig to a venue that wouldn't necessarily be able to accommodate one. So having a floor package that has many different fixtures in it also helps a little bit. You know, if you, if you just have one type of fixture in your floor package, you, know, you can only do so many different things. But if you throw a beam and a wash in your floor package, then all of a sudden you have twice as many different possibilities of looks that you can get out of that floor package. Um, floor package also can be moved around depending on different acts that are on the stage. So if you're doing a show that has both bands and DJ acts, then you're able to kind of modify the rig a little bit if you need to get a 10-piece band on all of a sudden and there isn't enough room, it's pretty easy to strike a couple towers of truss with some lights on them rather than um, if you just had the lights on the ground, for example, you know, it might be a little bit different when it comes to striking everything. Um, let's see. So... And I don't know how I don't have a bullet point yet about this, uh, is advancing. So advancing is the process of 
contacting the venue before the show and figuring out what you can do there. So the advance that I have, uh, I don't actually know how I have a copy to show you guys that, um, but it goes over a lot of different things. And oh, there's another annotation thing. Bye bye. Um, so I tend to. Oh, why do you keep doing this? Ah, sorry about that. Um, I tend to ask the same questions a bunch of times in my advance uh, because it seems like a lot of people don't read them quite through all the way. So I specifically state what I'm bringing. Um, I state, you know, how many people I need to help build it, how long it's going to take to build. Um, and if I'm flying stuff, you know, I need to get all of their rigging information, all of their, you know, rigging points, their weight loads, all that kind of stuff before I start the design so I can make sure that, you know, I'm hanging the right fixtures and putting the right weight in the right places and stuff like that. So advancing is like by far the most important part of all of this process, in my opinion, because if you have this great design you come up with and it's super awesome, but then you show up to the venue and it's not actually possible to execute it, it's a really bad feeling. So make sure that you're going through and getting all the proper information from the people at the venue beforehand, before you even start your design. You, you know, it's going to save you some time in the long run on revisions if you have that information right off the bat. Is there enough power available? Can you rent a generator? So a lot of these smaller venues aren't going to have a lot of power in the first place, let alone had enough power to run 20 Vipers. So if you want to, you know, have a fixture or uh, a rig with a ton of like really, really awesome fixtures that have great feature sets, but also just so happen to take up a lot of power, and you have to think about, are you able to rent a generator? Like, do they have that power available for you? Um, or can you use LED fixtures if there's not enough power? So instead of going with, you know, the most expensive, um, like Vipers or, you know, something like that, then you can go with LED fixtures in your design that take up a quarter of the power and are able to provide somewhat of the same experience as, you know, these more expensive fixtures would. And of course, you do have LED fixtures that take up just as much power as an incandescent fixture because it has a 400 watt LED in it. So in that instance, you know, it doesn't really work for you. But if you're able to use fixtures that take up less power, you're able to throw more of them in your rig. And at a smaller venue, mostly that makes it look better. There are definitely times where you can have too many fixtures on the stage in a small venue and it just looks messy. So, you know, you definitely have to plan that one out uh, ahead of time rather than getting to a venue and all of a sudden having to change your design because you don't have enough power. Uh, especially if, you know, you're not actually at the venue and you just did the design and the programmer operator shows up and can't execute your design and then has to improvise. So, you know, you definitely want to make sure that that's something you think of beforehand. Um, <clears throat> Also, what type of fixtures are available in the area that fit within the show budget? So when you're doing a one-off show, most of the time you're renting fixtures from an outside vendor. Um, some of you have your own fixtures and you're able to, you know, rent those ones and you're a lot more familiar with them. And, you know, that could be a win-win situation. But most of the time you have to rent fixtures from someone else. So if you have a bunch of a certain type of fixture in your rig, but none of those fixtures are available from any of the vendors in your area, then you're going to have a bad time. So it's something that you don't really want to have to go too far out of your local area to rent these fixtures. I mean, it, it depends on the client, of course, but in my experience, nobody wants to get fixtures from 250 miles away if they can get a similar type of fixture from 20 miles away. Um, and it also all goes you know, around that budget of the show too. So it really depends on uh, how much the client has to spend as to what fixtures you can use in your design. Um, add a video or laser element if the budget allows. So we went over this briefly before, but I'll touch back on it again, is if you're able to add 
lasers or, or some type of video element. It, it helps, you know, make your stage pop a little bit more so, and you can use a lot less of it on a smaller stage to get a pretty dramatic and big effect. So two lasers and, you know, you can turn your rig from looking like it has six lights into looking like it has 25, you know, so that's something that if the budget allows, I highly recommend doing it. Uh, it might mean bringing someone else onto the team to do some programming and operating, but I feel like teamwork makes a dream work, right? Um, okay, so what are the limitations of the space? height, width, and depth of the stage, and what kind of proscenium's or obstructions are present. Now, going back to this one again, and it is something that is going to be present in every type of stage design that we talk about here. Um, the limitations really are the main factor in the type of design that you can have for the space. So, you want to make sure that all of this is advanced ahead of time. Before you even start making your design, you figure out what you need or what type of space you have so you can get exactly what you need for the show. Try to get a CAD drawing or some type of plan for the room so you can properly pre -vis. Now, most small venues won't have this, but it is a really good idea to try. Uh, if you can pre -vis stuff ahead of time, it saves you or the person that is running the show time at the venue uh, and it also helps give the client something that they can see ahead of time to kind of get an idea of the show that they're going to get and then you know depending on the client they can you know make some suggestions or revisions and you can end up making your show a little bit more like what they wanted in the first place um so Also, let's talk a little bit about pre -vis. So, during the design process, I tend to have my console hooked up pretty much the whole time. So, when I'm placing lights, I can turn them on, see what they do, see if when they're in that place, they give me the effect that I want. And, you know, if they're not, what I can do to move them around. Because, you know, when you get to a show and you're trying to design a rig there, you know, you really have one shot. You know, you put it where it goes, and then if it works, it works. If it doesn't, like, it, that's kind of just what you get. Uh, but when you're designing a rig in pre -vis, then you're able to put lights in any place that you want to, see how they look, and then see uh, how you can place them maybe just a tiny bit differently to make them have a little bit better of an effect. Um, the program I use for pre -vis is Capture. I have the 2020 version, and they actually just added in reflection planes, which is kind of cool. So you're able to show the reflection of the lights that you see in your rig. Um, for certain types of shows, that could be super valuable. Um, I haven't had to use it quite yet, but I'm excited to play around with it a little bit more. Um, okay, so designing for tours. So, advancing, there we go. There's my bullet point for advancing. I don't know how I didn't put that in a previous slide. Uh, so it's the most important part of any tour design. So like, it really, really depends on what you can do with the tour as to what venues you're gonna be in. So when you're you know, doing your whole preliminary design for the tour, if it's a bunch of venues where you haven't been to before, I highly recommend reaching out ahead of time, and even if it's before the official advancing process has started, you know, just like kind of figure out what venues you're going to be at, look at their website, see if you can find somebody to contact and ask for a plot for their house rig, or just like any information about the stage, because you really want to design for the kind of average venue that you're going to be at on the tour. But you have to make sure that you have different versions of your design. So then moving on to this next bullet point here, have an A, B, and a C rig and being able to scale your design is the most important. So this rig right here was our A rig for this tour. And let me go to uh, wireframe view. So I put, oh, it's in my plot view, duh. So I put on here some 
uh, annotations that tell me the height, width, and depth of the stage. So this one was 28 and a half feet long, 10 foot 4 inches tall, and some amount of depth, and it's not showing me right now. There we go, 7 feet 10 inches uh, deep. Now, this was kind of like the medium sized rig. You know, this was the A rig, but it also gave me the ability. Oh, we don't want that. Uh, gave me the ability to scale it upwards because of the fact that it was curved like it is. So it being curved means if I needed to, I could make it a little bit flatter and make it wider. So when we got to some of these bigger venues, uh, I was able to kind of stretch it out to make it more like 30 feet wide. And, and it helped a little bit from uh, uh, for the perspective of just keeping the aspect ratio correct within the room. Um, but then when we went to smaller venues, I have, whoop, no, I have this version. And this version is the B rig. Oh, I keep hitting that thing, it's annoying. Um, so the B rig is what I did for this one is I ended up just taking the two outside towers off and then putting the schedule 40 pipe that I had on those towers down here at the bottom and putting some of the movers on the floor. So it's still the same amount of fixtures, but I was able to condense it down into a rig that fit onto a stage that is how many? I think it was like 18 or something like that. 19, 19 feet, three inches. And and of course that could be squeezed down a little bit more. I think like the smallest stage that I had on this tour was probably like 16 and a half feet. And we ended up just kind of scrunching it in super tough and yeah, it ended up working out. Um, but it is very important to be able to have different versions for different venues. Because when you're doing a tour with smaller to medium sized venues, and when I say small to medium size, I mean probably from about 100 people all the way up to maybe 1,500, you know? And that 1,500 is on the larger side of things. But there were some stops on the tour that did have those type of venues, and you, know, you have to be ready for all of those different things. Um, stop, annotation, go away. Okay. Um, let's see here. So what is the smallest venue on your tour and how can you make your C rig fit? So my first tour, I had no idea about any of this. And I had a design that I made, which was this right here. Um, so let me bring up this. So it was this, and it was a layered design. And it was something that could fit on kind of medium sized stages, but there were definitely situations where it needed to go onto smaller stages. So I came up with the, whoa, that's not what I meant to do. These little, the Z rig here, <laughs> this, is, this is even smaller than what I would consider a C rig for this stage because it doesn't really even look anything like it, but it's what we had to do to make it work in this venue. So this venue had, I think, eight foot ceilings and the stage was about 15 or 16 feet wide. So, you know, instead of the multi-layer video wall, like crazy, stage well, we just put up some truss towers on the ground as a floor package and put some movers on top with the video panels in between and, and it worked out great and honestly like it was kind of refreshing to see a stage look like that after having to build this monstrosity every day um let's see here make sure you have a backup plan for when venues don't have proper power so what I do is I purposely under amp all of my circuits when I'm touring. So when I have all my snakes set up for my touring rig uh, and all my loons set up, I, I have everything spaced out in a way that I can really double up what I'm doing and still not blow the circuit. So when I ask the venue for 10, 20 amp circuits, I can really get away with five and I don't want to because I would much rather not be teetering towards like 16 or 17 amps per circuit on a 20. Um, but if I need to, 
I can, and then I'm not, I don't have to sacrifice any of the rig to be able to work in a venue that doesn't have the proper power. Um, so have all front of house runs needed in your own snake. Do not rely on the venues for anything other than the house rig lines. I've made this a mistake about probably twice now, and I'll never do it again. I always travel with my own snake. I always have redundance built into my snake as well, and I always make sure that even if the venue says they have four Ethernet lines and three DMX lines, like I just run my own because I know that I built it. I know it works properly for my system, and I know it's most likely not going to break. When it comes to the venue stuff, you know, it, it, it's not exactly the case all the time. So definitely make sure you use your own snake uh, and try to be a stickler about it. Like I know a lot of venues will be like, oh, we don't want to fly this snake, but make them fly the snake. You, you, you want to use it for sure. Um, so think about labor. Will you be able to build this on time every day with a minimum amount of hands? Small venues equal small budget. So huh, that is the truth. So you got to think about this during the initial design phase, like when you're coming up with this really awesome rig that has like 45 vipers in it and, you know, you got a ton of LED panels and all this stuff you want to build, but you only have two hands every day to build it. You know, it's not really feasible to have that many lights in venues like that. So even if you can fit all that on the stage at this small venue, you have to realize that like their workforce isn't going to be that of an arena or even like a like, kind of like a mid-sized venue that you go to that'll have like a whole house crew that comes and helps you. You know, these venues sometimes will just have one or two people that, you know, are there as friends of the venue owners and they're there to help you out, but they really don't know very much about what's going on. And that's something you have to plan for. Like, and you, you can think that, you're going to get the best hands every day and, and everything's going to be great, but it's most likely not going to be the case. So when you're designing your rig, think about how you can execute that build with the minimum amount of people available. Um, how do you, in, how you integrate house rig fixtures into your design? So if you walk into a venue and you see Martin fixtures, you pretty much know the venue's up to par and that is real and it has been proven over and over again in so many venues I've gone to. And, you know, a lot of venues will just have cheap Chinese fixtures and it sucks. Uh, and they don't even know what the, <laughs> the DMX values are for it. So you have to look it up yourself or do a fixture find, you know, but you walk in, you see they have Martin fixtures. You're like, okay, cool, awesome. I know that everything's gonna be plugged in right for the most part, like, cause if venues have the money to spend on good fixtures, they normally have the money to spend on good techs as well. So it, it's definitely, something to look forward to when you walk into a venue and see Martin, or when you look at an advance and you see your, the Martin fixtures are on the plot. Um, but you also have to be able to integrate these fixtures into your design. So that's what I did with, oh, I keep going back and forth here, with this one, is I added house fixtures in, and these fixtures, they're, they're fake. They don't even actually really exist in real life. There's no venue with this configuration of fixtures, but it was just something so I can have my programming stuff just kind of clone right over as soon as, as, soon as I go into the venue. Now, I'll, a lot of you guys are probably going to be programming, designing, operating, if you're listening to this webinar. Uh, a lot of people that are just starting out in this industry don't quite realize that these are all separate jobs technically. And a lot of times you'll be designing a rig, someone else will be programming it, and then another person will be running the show. But with these smaller venue gigs, most of the time, the person that's designing it is also programming it and then also running it too. So you have to think about how you're gonna take those house fixtures and use those to your advantage in your design. So you may have a small floor package that you're bringing with you from show to show, but you know that like most of these venues are gonna have at least like six to eight movers in the ceiling and some front wash. So you don't have to necessarily like take up space in your trailer to bring a whole front truss to be able to light up the band. You can rely on the house rig fixtures that are already existing in the venue to do so. Um, also, how to integrate existing rigging points into your rig. So if you are advancing for a tour 
and I want to say there are more than 25% of the venues that allow you to fly stuff. I would recommend having a version of your rig that has that, uh, that flying stuff incorporated into it. Uh, I definitely wouldn't recommend doing a tour of small venues and then having your only rig be a rig that you fly because you're going to show up to a bunch of venues and you're not going to be able to fly anything because they don't have the rigging points, they have low ceilings, or they don't want to strike their existing fixture hang. So if you do properly advance your tour and you're able to have a considerable amount of those venues that do have the ability to fly stuff, I would recommend creating a version of your rig that has those fly points incorporated into it as well. All right, designing for permanent installs. Now this is the last category that I kind of came up with here for the types of designs that I personally have done. Um, there's architectural design, but we're not really going to get into that because it's not uh, in a small venue, or I mean, it could be, but it is not in this instance. So designing for permanent installs. What are the existing rigging points? Can any be added? And what is the weight cap of those rigging points? So something to find out, either go in with a structural engineer beforehand, or if they already have that information available for you at the venue, uh, find it out ahead of time before you start your design, figure out where you can rig, what you can rig, and how much of it you can rig as well. Um, can you use truss in the design? So a lot of these permanent installs, like, they don't like truss. Like, it, it depends on what you're doing, really. I've worked on a few where they're like, we want everything to be flush up with the ceiling. We don't want to see any truss or any wires. We want it to just look very elegant. And, you know, that definitely presents challenges because truss is one of the easiest things to rig and, you know, most uh, effective things to hang lights from. Um, but you can also use Schedule 40 pipe to do this. So you can mount some Schedule 40 pipe to, you know, whatever rigging points you have and then hang fixtures from that. And that way you don't have a big old hunky piece of truss hanging from the ceiling in everybody's view. Um, if you can use truss, uh, me personally, I really don't like this, but a lot of people tend to use truss warmers where you put lights inside the truss to light them up. Uh, and it can make your design look a lot bigger if you do that but it also lights the truss up. And personally, I don't like seeing truss, but a lot of people do. And I've seen, uh, I think it was the Mercury Ballroom in Louisville, which is actually the last show of our tour this uh, last winter. Um, they use truss warmers really, really well. And, and when the LD there asked me if I wanted uh, truss warmers when I was patching in my rig, I was like, nah, nah, I don't like truss warmers, it's whatever. And then, and then I saw him do the openers, and I was like, whoa, wow, you made that look really awesome. Like, good job. Like, I want those truss warmers now. So, you know, it's personal preference for sure, but it definitely can help with the design process if you don't have a huge budget and you need to make the rig look a little bit bigger. Throw some truss warmers in there. Light up the truss, and it gives you a whole different picture to work with. Um, so what is the budget? This pretty much dictates everything. As with any show, it's how much you have to spend on the fixtures and uh, that really dictates what you can do. Um, so with this, it also kind of correlates with how much you're getting paid. So the venue may have a $20,000 budget for fixtures, but then they only have a $500 budget for you. You know, you got to make sure that you're getting paid fairly when it comes to this. Uh, Smaller venues especially like to take advantage of us lighting designers and pay us very, very little in comparison to the amount of money that they end up breaking in. Uh, so make sure that when you're working out your budget, you figure out a fair amount for yourself to get paid for doing the work that you're doing. Um, how can I use that budget to get the best fixtures available for the job? So when it comes to permanent installs, you need to get fixtures that are going to last because the last thing you want to do is have to go back in in a year and put new fixtures in or repair fixtures. And I mean, it is inevitable. Like fixtures do break. The more money you spend on a fixture, the longer it's going to go before breaking. That's just kind of the rule of thumb with these things. You know, if you go with an MH series light versus the Viper, you're probably going to end up having to fix that MH series before the Viper. Um, but it's also less expensive to fix those uh, lower budget fixtures. 
And a lot of them you can do yourself because they don't have a thousand moving parts inside. They have uh, a gobo, a color wheel, and a prism. And you know, a lot of people can open those up themselves and, and get it fixed if you, you know, don't have the budget for, or the venue doesn't have the budget to send it out for repair. So having an in-house repair department definitely can help with that one. Um, but when it comes down to it, you wanna make sure that you're using the right fixtures and you're not just like getting a bunch of strobes and putting them in there when really you need a bunch of front light. So making sure that uh, before you really get into the whole install process, you have a solid design drawn up and a couple different versions of it. So in case you're not able to do something you wanted to, you already have a backup plan ready to go for how else you can hang those fixtures. Um, use LED pixel tape ran through a media server to accent trussing or parts of the room for an inexpensive way to make stuff pop. So LED pixel tape is great. It's inexpensive. It is super bright depending on which kind you get and where you put it. And you can do a lot of stuff with it. So you can either get RGB tape for way cheaper, which is just one color, red, green, blue, and all the mixes in between. Or you can get pixel tape, which is a little tiny bit more expensive, but you got uh, individually controlled pixels that you can integrate into your design. And if you run it through a media server, then you can trigger that media server with your lighting console and you don't have to use up all your parameters. So you can run 200 universes worth of pixel tape and not even touch barely half a universe worth of control in your Grand MA, for example. Uh, so that's definitely something I would recommend for when you're designing for permanent installs is try to use pixel tape. Like it's great, it's cheap, and you can put it pretty much anywhere. Um, so if programming the rig as well, try to have the venue purchase the console you're best at using as that's how you get the best result. Now, of course, you should know tons of different consoles. Like as a designer, limiting yourself to one console is a bad idea. Um, but you also do want to give the client the best possible experience. So if you're a Grand MA programmer and they have a Campsys board there, you know, like either learn Campsys and program an okay show or convince the venue to upgrade to Grand MA, and then you have the console that you are proficient on, you give them a great show, and they're super happy with the result. Or bring someone else in the program that is a campus programmer, and you do the design, they do the programming. You know, it could go either way, any way when it comes to that, but it really is up to you as to how you're going to achieve the best result, because that is uh, what the client wants, it's what you want, is the best possible result of the design. Um, okay, last but not least, the power situation on a permanent install. So this is super important because you're not going to be there every night, most likely, um, to monitor the rig and make sure that everything's going all right. And a lot of times the people that work at venues, you can't really trust to know that much about power or know where all the breakers are or know what's plugged into what. So when you're designing your rig for a permanent install, you want to make sure that you're using fixtures in a way that the power is spaced out very evenly. And it really comes down to in your previs or however you're doing your preliminary design, uh, come up with a wiring diagram. Uh, Capture has a really great way of labeling circuits. So when you go into your patch, when you print out your patch, you know, it'll list all the different lights and what circuit they're on. So you can label things before they go up in the air as to what circuit they're on to make sure that you have everything spaced out in exactly the correct way. Um, okay, I think we're almost there. So recap. So we're gonna go over these kind of quickly because we're out of time. We've got five more minutes here. Um, so how much space do you have available for your rig? Super important. If you can't fit it on the stage, it's not gonna work. So you have to build that into your design when you're first starting. Um, how much power is available for your fixtures? Also very important when you're designing your rig, if you design a rig with a bunch of fixtures that take up a ton of power you don't have, you can't use them. So you wanna make sure that you are picking the right fixtures for the amount of power that is available. Um, 
what kind of design you're working on, touring, one-off, or install. Now, as we went over those slides previously, there are a lot of similarities to the three different types of designs, but there are also some distinct differences, uh, especially when it comes to touring. So definitely make sure that you are keeping all of those things in your mind when you're starting your design. Uh, and let's see, what type of obstacles might you overcome once at the venue? Uh, what's going to be in the way? How tall is it? How wide is it? Uh, are the, is the band going to fit on the stage with your design? So on and so forth. Uh, what kind of rigging is available for you to use? Uh, if you do have the ability to fly stuff, do it because it's great. Flying stuff looks awesome in almost every scenario. Um, but also knowing when you don't have that available and when you do have to use a floor package uh, versus hanging your rig. Um, how much help will you have to execute the build? So when you are designing, think about who's going to be building it. Small venues don't have a lot of budget for hands, so you're going to have two to four max, like at, at each one of these venues you go to. Unless it's a one-off. I'm mostly talking about a tour when it comes to that. Uh, when you're doing a one-off show, you have a little bit more uh, leeway to kind of bring people in for the show. Uh, tours, it's one show after another every single night. So uh, it's kind of tough to find extra hands every day in that kind of situation. Uh, advancing. So here we go again, advancing. Always advance every show, ever, forever, always. Because you, the last thing you want to do is design an awesome rig that you're super proud of and then not be able to use it because the venue can't accommodate. Um, using the correct types of fixtures for the space. So like I said before, like you don't want to have a bunch of strobes in your rig when what you really need is front light. So you want to make sure that you know who you're lighting. So if you're lighting a band or a DJ, how they like to be lit, what kind of effects they like, because ultimately you're working for them. So make sure that, you know, if they don't like a bunch of beam effects, don't get a bunch of beams for your design. Uh, and yeah, and also when it comes to the space as well. So if you're in, say, a white room where it's just, oh God, what was it? It was a festival I did a few years ago where the stage was just in this like community center and it was just a solid white room, like the walls, the ceiling, the floor, everything was all white. So everything we did just reflected off of everything. It was crazy. I had to run the rig at probably like 25% for everything, and it was all LED fixtures. Um, if Fred's watching, uh, he'll remember that one. <laughs> um, so definitely making sure that you have the right types of fixtures for the space and programming and operating for the space as well too. Like if we have a big white room, we don't wanna just point the fixtures right at the wall and light up the whole room the whole time. We wanna figure out a way to kind of move them around in a way that doesn't overpower everything else going on in the space. Um, well, we have one minute left. I think we're almost there. Um, let's see, what are the notes that I have here? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, okay, so let's talk for one second about if someone else is doing the programming and not you how to design the rig to be programmer friendly. Um, it's very important that you have fixtures in the correct mm -hmm. modes. So making sure that like if you have uh, fixtures with like a ton of different feature sets to use the mode that is kind of like in the middle to make it so it's a little bit easier for the person that's programming it to actually get the job done. Uh, me personally, I like, extended mode, but you know, a lot of people don't. <laughs> so uh, definitely think about that when you're designing your rig as well. Um, and I think that is it. Thanks for watching. Uh, you can check out some of my stuff uh, at warmholtahoe.com slash lighting design. Uh, and thanks Martin for having me, super appreciate it. All right, thanks, Jason. That was wonderful. I think that everybody would agree that for your first webinar, you did an amazing job. So no worries there at all. Um, we do have some questions if you're open to it. Um, yeah, absolutely. The, yeah, the first one is asking, what 3D design software are you using? Uh, it is called Capture. 
Uh, this is the 2020 edition, and it has honestly been much improved since last year. Like, the rendering on it is spectacular. Uh, you can do pretty much everything you need to in it, including all your plotting and all of your uh, reports. So definitely what I would recommend in terms of uh, 3D software. Uh, there's tons of choices out there. Uh, Capture's relatively inexpensive for what it is, so I, I definitely say go for it if you're looking for something. Uh, they also have a free demo, so download it, try it out, see how you like it, and then you can buy it if you like. Okay, the next question is actually on Capture also. Um, they're asking if you only use it for previs or can you also use it for the actual design? Um, and is it a good program for someone who's mostly just a tech to learn more design skills? Yeah, you can absolutely use it for the design. Uh, it's not quite as feature rich as say Vectorworks or software like that, but all of the design work that I've done has been within Capture. And I highly recommend checking it out, especially if you don't really have that much experience with 3D software. It's really intuitive and easy to use. And it really helps my whole process as to being able to test stuff out in my design before I actually implement it. Okay, and then one last question about Capture. Um, this person is wondering if you exclusively use Capture or do you also use Vectorworks, YWG for paperwork, plans, et cetera? I pretty much exclusively use Capture. Uh, I just recently got a Vectorworks license and I'm in the process of learning it, but it is a little bit more complicated, so it's probably gonna take a little while before I fully move over to that for my design work. All right, the next question is asking if you have any experience with wireless DMX. I do, and it's not good. I don't recommend it. Uh, there is, I think, gosh, City Theatrical, I'm pretty sure, makes uh, a version that's really good. It's also really expensive. So if it's the kind of thing where you're doing like a theater show where you need wireless DMX for props and stuff like that, then it's great. Then I would highly recommend using it. If you're just trying to save a little bit of cable run on your front of house, just run the cable. It's gonna be way better for you in pretty much every situation to spend that little bit of extra time to run the cable rather than to use wireless. All right, the next question is asking if you've used set cards with casters in your rigs or designs. I'm sorry, could you say that one more time? Yes, the question is asking if you have ever used set cards with casters in your rigs or designs. I have not. All right, the next question is, um, hi, Jason, I work at a venue that has quite a few jazz and classical shows that don't want haze. Could you suggest any creative or more subtle design elements to try? Um, yeah, anything pixel mapping. So any fixture that you can, that has multiple different cells that you can send information through, you don't really need haze for it to have its wow factor. Like the haze definitely helps, but say you have like a, a batten you don't necessarily want to see all the, uh, you know, the beam definition of a batten in the air. You really want that to be kind of just eye candy. So you can use fixtures like that to, you know, add an element to your stage that doesn't need haze, um, as well as fixtures that have uh, really awesome gobos and prisms. Like anything where you can overlap two different prisms uh, is going to be a really awesome element to add for when you can't use haze. Okay, next question is asking, are you ever concerned about blowing a budget on media servers with a lot of LED tape? No, not at all. Uh, LED tape, you really don't need something super powerful to run it. Uh, you can use any media server that outputs ArtNet or streaming ACN. Uh, you can also do it within your lighting console, but that's going to eat up your parameters really quickly. So that's the reason I recommended a media server is, you know, most of them, don't have limits on the amount of like ArtNet or streaming ACN universes you can send out. Uh, some of them do, uh, but the ones that I've worked with in the past are really easy to use and set up for triggering with a lighting console, as well as outputting uh, very, very intricate patterns to the LED strip. So no, I really don't have to worry about blowing a budget on that. 
All right, the next question is asking, for the types of shows that you do, what is an average budget for a lighting rig? Oh, that, it, it really varies. Uh, the average budget, say, if somebody were to just hire me to come out and bring out lighting, would probably be around $1,500 to $2,000. Okay. Um, the next question is also related to budget. Um, they're asking, what would you invest in with a really low budget, like 7K, in a venue with 100, with, um, 100 square meters in size? Uh, check out the Martin MH series beams. Uh, they're inexpensive. They get the job done. They have a really rich feature set for what they are. Um, but anything in the MH series is kind of like the the lower tier version of the Martin fixtures, and they'll give you as close to that quality that you get out of like a Viper than anything else you can buy. So that's definitely what I would recommend. Okay, the next question is asking, how do you adapt for an outdoor venue or patio show? Uh, if you can, tons of haze, as much haze as you can outside. Uh, also having fans for your hazers or fog machines. Um, it, it's one thing if you just get like a burst right there on the stage and cool, you can see the beams for a second, but having some fans strategically placed throughout the venue or patio or outdoor area uh, helps a ton. Uh, I've actually seen people go as far as to having a fog machine with a fan and a generator on a wagon and they would drag that around the dance floor at the venue to get even haze coverage. All right, the next question is asking, do you always travel with a console or are you sometimes dependent on the venue's desk? When I'm touring, I always travel with a console and a backup. Um, if I'm doing one-off shows, and I, I was an Ava Lights programmer for six or seven years, and then I recently switched over to Grand MA. So now I can be like, oh, you have an MA full size on, on your rider? Okay, cool. And, and they're gonna have that there ready and waiting. I know it's gonna work. Um, but before I switched to Grand MA, that wasn't the case, and I would always bring my own console. All right, the next question is asking, what is the smallest venue you have worked in, and how did you achieve good design in that space? <laughs> so the smallest venue I've ever worked in um, was, so Wormhole Tahoe is the, uh, the crew that I work with up here in Lake Tahoe, and we did uh, shows at Moe's Barbecue, which was a really, really small barbecue joint. We would do shows in the downstairs room, which is even smaller than their upstairs. Um, and it was, it was the kind of thing where they had a TV on the wall. So we used that to project visuals onto, and I used two truss towers with some LED moving headlights. Uh, and I think there are sometimes we actually threw a couple lasers on there too. I mean, it was a super small rig, but for the space, it filled it out, like it was a ton. Like it looked like a lot more than there really was. Um, so when it comes to really, really small venues, like it's it's really a kind of a different art form because you have to use the space a lot more so than if there's a stage. Like this, for example, there was no stage. It was just in a barbecue restaurant. So that is the smallest I've done. <laughs> Okay, the next question is asking, would you rather use haze or fog in open air shows? In open air shows, I like to have a combination of the two. So I like to have a hazer on stage because the band or the DJ, like they don't like giant puffs of fog and, and neither do I really. I think that look is kind of tacky when you just, the entire stage is filled with fog. So I'll use hazers on the stage and I'll put a fogger at front of house with a powerful fan on it blowing towards the stage. Uh, or sometimes it's kind of straight up depending on how the wind is blowing. So I would definitely recommend outdoor shows, hazer on stage, fogger at front of house. Okay, we have one final question. What was the biggest surprise you encountered at a venue and how did you deal with it? Oh, the biggest surprise. God, that's actually a tough question. There's so many surprises. Um, um, Biggest surprise, man, yeah, that's a tough one. I really don't know. Um, <laughs> I would have to say it was when I showed up to a venue and there was like, they told me that there was like a, I think a nine foot clearance 
but they didn't mention the fact that that nine foot clearance was in between their like already existing fire sprinkler system. So, so I couldn't even do my C rig there. I had to like build something completely different. And, and it's like, that's the, really the importance of advancing is making sure you get all the information ahead of time, especially those little nuances. Like, yeah, I have a nine foot clearance, but my fire sprinkler pipes are at seven and a half feet. You know, like stuff like that. So that was probably the most surprise that I've gotten. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jason. We really appreciate you presenting today. And thank you to everyone who attended the presentation. We appreciate you taking your time out. Um, if you're interested in upcoming sessions, you can find those on the calendar at pro.harman.com. And as a reminder, this session was recorded, so if you wanted to forward it on to anybody or check it out at a later date, this will be posted in several days. So thanks so much and have a great day.